Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with the lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This is a continuing of a lesson that we started Sunday, part 375R. We're reviewing and continuing a lesson titled Luciferian Breakdown, part 2R. I want to give a brief recapitulation before you actually go into the lesson. Uh, Genesis. Turn to Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15. And I'll put enmity, variance, antagonism, strife between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, the serpent and the serpent races, and the human race and the prototokes that will come forth from the human race. It shall bruise thy head, in other words, ultimately destroy the serpent, the serpent races and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's going to damage the, uh, <coughs> cause damage within the prototokus, <coughs> but it will not be a severe damage. Now, we want to take a look at some principles. This was not lost on the serpent. He looked at it as a threat. Literally, the pronunciation of his destruction is the destruction of his races. He didn't take it lightly from the beginning. So he determined he was going to embark, embark upon a course that would initiate and um, end in his safety, his dodging this judgment, <laughs> his own mind. What an act of desperation. How did it happen? What took place? Well, we're going to see the results of it, then we're going to trace it back, then we're going to get into our lesson. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Remember that word enmity. In Galatian, I mean in Genesis 3.15, he said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. Well, the serpent wound up putting enmity between the human race and God. Mm -hmm. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The human race has been thoroughly destroyed. It is rendered an amnesiac, which uh, basically is a, a walking death uh, creature, as far as God is concerned. <clears throat> it has no capacity, the human race has no understanding Unlike the other races on the other worlds, they have no comprehension of a goal. 
a purpose, a past, a destiny. The human, the human mind has been rendered null and void to the point where God cannot use it. So he's judged them. Turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter. And we're going to pick it up in um, just a minute. Verse 12 to 13. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The whole human race is dead. That's the only thing we want. How was that possible? Through the serpent. The serpent so damaged the mind of man, crippled it, literally made it so dysfunctional that God didn't have any choice but to judge it. Every single human being falls under this. It all sin. How did this happen? How was this possible? How did the serpent do this? How did he make all people to sin? He uses the same method. He does not change. We're going to look at the methodology in this respect in understanding why the human race is where it's at, the despicable condition that it currently is in, and how we have been drawn totally contrarily out of death into the essence, the quintessence of life. Principle, we're going into the lesson now. Scripture teaches <clears throat> after detecting the saint's weakness, the enemy will try to craft an alluring reality where the saint or the unsaved person can fulfill it. In other words, the enemy will observe the life to look for flaws and vulnerabilities. And when they detect the flaw and a the vulnerability, they immediately go into <coughs> purposely crafting a condition in that life in which the vulnerability will be given the ability to function, become the overall purpose in that life so that life can be drawn into destruction. Turn to First Chronicles. Twenty-one. First one, we're going to look at examples of how the enemy operates. First Chronicles 21, verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoke David <clears throat> to number Israel. Now basically what's being said here, <clears throat> when it says Satan stood up, it's the, the, the Hebrew word is withstood Israel. And enticed, enticed 
David to number Israel. What happens? <coughs> Satan observed David's vulnerability, his pride. And he begins to erect a condition in which an opportunity for David's pride to come forth to entrap him, bring him into bondage. Well, how did he do this? By numbering Israel. The Lord basically had told, made a provision that kings weren't to number their armies, populations, because what would happen is the king would develop a confidence in himself in his war-making abilities, in his numbers, lose confidence in YHVH. So he outlaws this. Turn to verse 2, same chapter. David said to Joab <clears throat> and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. So he being in the position of king, knowing what the provision of YHVH was, that you don't do this, said, I'm going to do it. This is Satan. Satan draws out the vulnerability. He's given authority. He's not taking into objective comprehension his authority. He's focusing through the vulnerability, bringing about what he wants done. Notice what Joab says his defense minister, verse 3, Joab answered, The Lord make his people in a hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab is giving David objective, wise counsel. <clears throat> He's saying, David, you know the Lord doesn't want you to do this. You're king. You have authority over all these people. Why do you want to exercise this flying in the face of what you know God doesn't want you to do? Notice what it goes on to say in <clears throat> verse 4. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. So he numbers all Israel, gives them, gives them the lump sum number of the people, the tribes, the war-making capacity, all that, and he brings it back to David. So this constitutes the fulfillment of the temptation. David's vulnerable aspect has been allowed to triumph over his ability to objectively evaluate and bring about consequences. Mm. You brought about, um, you brought to light, I should say, in Sunday's lesson, that the child, the Yeshiva's child, mm -hmm. who died, mm -hmm. had to be done from Mike's VH's perspective because that child would then have been uh, an instrument of the Luciferians. Sure. To what degree, if any, did David understand that? Oh, he probably understood it totally. Mm. But he still didn't want it to happen. But let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the snare. The snare is the ability that the spirit in the spiritual realm has to influence the victim in the physical realm. The snare is designed to enhance the desire. In other words, when he's, the, the spirit finds a vulnerability, he builds, he constructs a condition to maximize the ability of that vulnerability to flourish. Sets up conditions where the th the, the vulnerability, the weakness, can be the, the, the one driving force in the individual's life. Scripture teaches the snare is designed to enhance <clears throat> the desire of the saint and to neutralize his state of alertness. Turn to 2 Samuel 
11, we're going to read verses 1 to 4. We're going to see how the enemy sets up conditions in the physical realm from the spiritual realm in which the vulnerability can dominate the desire, override objective evaluation in the situation, literally blinding the person to achieving everything but what he wants to achieve. 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. <clears throat> it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, this is the design of the weapon. This is the design of the snare. David should have been with his army. David accedes to a thought. You send his army out, he's going to kick back in Jerusalem, setting the stage for a consistent determination of things that fly against, in other words, things that should have been done aren't being done because the desire within the individual is overriding the natural inclination to do what is right. Yes? Could it be said about David, is he only a king or was he a prophet as well? He's a prophet, but not in the same sense as uh, Zechariah and um, Ezekiel and that. So he, I'm thinking, his look, revelation. If, he, if he's getting thoughts, he's getting it from somewhere. Is it a Holy Spirit that's given him thoughts? And then we find out that it's going against what White Fish has already said. Well, he's getting thoughts from the Luciferians. Contrary to God. He's accepting the thoughts. He knows better, but he's not acceding to it because the enemy has scoped out a vulnerability. David's not fighting to keep the vulnerability under control. He's yielding subtly to desires that make the vulnerability come to manifestation. It's interesting. It's, I, I'm seeing pride involved here big time. Of course. Of course. Well, let's go on. So David is not with his men. He's kicking back, which he knows better. But he's subtly yielding. The enemy doesn't come in, in, in this situation and confront you. He comes with subtlety to enable you, the carnal part, to yield to what it feels is comfortable, what it feels is alluring. He is able to seduce through the senses, through allurement, bringing out the vulnerability of the individual. That's not what he's saying, what he's doing here. It came to pass in an evening tide, so David's been in Jerusalem for a while, kicking back, and this particular night, it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Why is he doing that? He's acceding to a thought. He's sleeping. Thought tells him, wake up. He wakes up. Of going out on the roof, just take a look over at the city. This is Luciferian subtlety working on a sub subdernal level, subconscious level. David's not questioning it, he's just uh, obeying it. This whole thing has been a snare, engineered. David would have wiped it out from the beginning if he had not acceded to a thought. Let Joab go in and, you know, take care of his business. I'm going to kick back. That's the first phase of the snare. Doing what you know you should not do. 
rationalizing it. I'm king. You know, we've, we've been winning all these battles. They don't really need me. A rationale. It takes the enemy to a further capacity to reach David's vulnerability. He's in his bed. He wakes up. He walks on the roof at a certain time. Note what happens. He walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. This is not an accident. You have both of these people acceding to Luciferian manipulation. What is she doing in an exposed position where she can be seen washing herself? She sees to a thought. What's David doing over here? A seeds to a thought. When this took place, the XY axis crosses. The vulnerability comes forth. The only thing David can think of now is gratifying and satisfying the lust of his desire. Look what he goes on to say. David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. David knows this is another man's wife. Doesn't matter. Why? Because he determined he wants to gratify his desire at this point. And he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. This is the method that is done, that was done, when the serpent came out of the garden. He immediately embarked upon making every single human being on earth sin through the allure. He would scope out an individual's weakness, vulnerability, and that individual would be moved to trespass. You just read it in Romans 5th chapter. They didn't sin after Adam's transgression. They didn't take the tree of knowledge of good and evil and disobey. They sinned a million other different ways, but they all sinned. The whole human race was led into sinning. That generated a generation curse upon the whole human race. Satan didn't lose any time in corrupting the Adamic race. He used the same method that he uses today. Why, you say, does he use the same method today? Because it wasn't enough to have them go into bondage. They have to be kept in bondage. So David does this. Seals his fate. Brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches unless the allure is perpetuated, it will be neutralized, leaving the victim ensnared and in captivity. <coughs> when the desire is fulfilled, <coughs> The enemy doesn't need the allure anymore because he's achieved what he wants to achieve. We see the example of this. Turn back to 2 Samuel 24, verse 10. 2 Samuel 24, verse 10. <clears throat> he sends Joab out. Number of the people, Job numbers the people, comes back, gives them the information. <clears throat> and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant. For I have done very foolishly. <clears throat> Turn to James. First chapter, right after Hebrews.
James the first chapter <coughs> verse 14 and 15 But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. In other words, when the lust has been fulfilled, the act has been completed, it is now sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You get the consequences of it. Now, <clears throat> this is a principle which never changes. David, when he realized what had happened, he knew he had acted foolishly. He knew. Turn to Matthew. 27. Actually, actually, before you go there, bear with me a moment. Okay, yeah, Matthew 27, <clears throat> verse 1 to 4. We're going to read about Judas Iscariot. As you are turning, at the Last Supper, Jesus informs Judas that he knows he's going to betray him. And literally, he tells him, don't do it. Basically, if you do, you are going to incur a judgment that <clears throat> is unimaginable, don't do it. Judas is basically uh, under satanic influence. Satan literally enters into him. <clears throat> he goes and does it. Now Matthew 27 Verse 1, we're going to read verses 1 to 4. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. When the alluring has been fulfilled, the enemy doesn't need to seduce you any longer because you've done what he wants you to do. Then the realization hits. What have I done? <clears throat> Scripture teaches, we just read it in James, fulfilling the desire constitutes a breaking of the law of sin and death. In other words, when that happens, it becomes a case of sin, immediately the law of sin and death enters in with a judgment opens the life to curses and judgments. 2 Samuel 24 we're going to read verses 11 to 13.
ear. YGH sends the prophet Nathan, to, uh, the prophet Gad, to pronounce judgment. Starting in verse 11. And when David was up in the, in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies, while they pursue thee, or that there three days there be three days of pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. There are three choices, all of them devastating. For doing what? For allowing your pride to supersede your wisdom. Allowing, not being alert, seeing the signs that lead to an act that constitutes sin that immediately necessitates a judgment. Because of what David did here, 70,000 men died. Innocent men. <clears throat> they were only obeying his orders. Turn to Second Samuel 12. We're going to read verses 7 to 12. This is the method that Satan has used to keep the human race in a death spiral since the fall of man. <clears throat> and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I have given thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, <clears throat> and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. <clears throat> now therefore, judgment, the sword shall never, never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, and before the son. Judgment. <clears throat> David never rose to what he had once been after that because of the things that he had to deal with the sorrows mm -hmm. the sons dying and literally one son betraying him and almost taking over the throne on and on and on and on Never, David died basically a broken man in depression and despair mm -hmm. <clears throat> why? for one moment of pleasure but this is Satan's methodology. Yeah. It works to perfection. Every single day this operation is taking place. People's vulnerabilities are being... Attorney Ephesians, you see it yourself. Ephesians, second chapter. <coughs>
Peace is the second chapter, <coughs> verse 2 to 3. Where in the time past you walked according to the course of this world. The course of this world. This pseudo reality operates off of this way. The manifestation <clears throat> of temptations, the erection of conditions designed to bring forth the vulnerability in the individual. Notice what he goes on to say, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle, in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This is no, Satan doesn't deviate one iota because it's been 100% successful. Everyone you can see that's not vigilant is pursuing the desire of his flesh or his mind trying to fulfill, and when it gets fulfilled, he brings a judgment and a curse more on himself. This is the whole human, that's why you have wars. That's why you have the spiraling <clears throat> downward to destruction of nations. That's why you have our country, being in the state that it's in, lies are being told for truth. People who are honest are being disregarded, cast away, thieves, Rogues, miscreants, liars are being exalted as something to be revered and watched uh, and matched. It's satanic manipulation brought forth on a whole scale basis. <clears throat> the only one that's going to escape all of this is the individual that is alert to Satan's machinations. Doesn't matter whether you're saved or unsaved, you're going to find that he operates the same way. Only the person is vigilant, open to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will quicken us. Satan is going to operate. If you're a mature Christian, Satan is not going to confront you openly. He is going to subtly put thoughts in your mind to try to bring about the manifestation of your vulnerability. <clears throat> we all have vulnerabilities, weaknesses, character flaws. He's working on that. And when he when he receives a positive return, he's going to zero in on that vulnerability to maximize it. He's going to try to create a condition in your life where you have the ability to bring that thing to its fruition. So you can enter into a snare, a trap, and ultimate bondage to the Luciferians. This is how he expects to avoid the judgment. Mm. Figure there's not going to be anybody around that's been successful, so there won't be anybody around ultimately defeating. But he's wrong. Because the Prototokis group is going to have the ability to overcome. That's why all the promises are given to the overcomer. God has designed a path for each one of us where Satan is allowed. Just like he was allowed to do with Jesus, he is allowed to try to bring forth your vulnerability so it can be exploited. This is the Father's way. You, at that point, are expected to be an overcomer. You are going to suffer. We're all going to suffer. That's not, you can't escape it. But the victory in the suffering is what gives us the freedom to receive what the Father has called us to receive. <clears throat> Sonship. The adoption. 
Turn, we're going to close. Turn to Romans 8. 15. 17. Romans 8, 15 to 17. <clears throat> For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So the Holy Spirit in us is the spirit of adoption. His job is to lead us on the path of trial to enable us <clears throat> to overcome the obstacles on this path. <clears throat> the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified together. Don't carp, grab, complain because you're going through something. <clears throat> Rejoice because you're going through something. Mm -hmm. If you're not going through something, you're not qualifying for the adoption. Simple as that. If you're not qualifying for the adoption, things aren't going to end right. But if you are enduring, if you are overcoming, the scripture tells us to rejoice. Because we have been counted worthy to endure the sufferings of Christ. We're suffering with Him. We're going to be glorified together. And to me, there can be no, no better hope no better uh, a thing to look forward to than that. <clears throat>